Good. Hello and welcome to another episode of Worlds Collide. I'm your host, Justin. And I'm Mitch. And today we bring you a very confusing character. <laughs> a try for any, for a time traveling for... genius. Yes. If anybody was here for our episode on cable and thought that cable was confusing, <laughs> hold on to your socks. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea. Who's who who could we compare this character to other than Cable? Uh, who else has a really fucked up history? Well, in a way, he could be compared to Jet Li's the one because he he goes around killing other versions of himself. I did think of that movie when uh I first heard about Kang. I that was like one of the first thoughts that popped in my head. I'm like, Jet Li, the yeah. one. Like <laughs> yeah. um Yeah. Um, and as far as DC is concerned, like their big time traveler is Booster Gold, and he kind of does the same thing as what Kang does, but he does it for good, whereas Kang does it for evil. Right. Okay. So why don't we get a couple just fact points out of the way that should help to clarify things going forward for the the episode? Yeah. So people who are just tuning in. Uh, first, I'd like to explain why we chose Kang the Conqueror. Because right now, who is Kang the Conqueror is the better question. He's not in any of the Avengers movies. He's not been mentioned in any of the upcoming projects. There's no Kang the Conqueror movie. He hasn't been shown in any of the TV series. They're, the The only thing you might have caught was they cast Kang the Conqueror. I See, like the pick. Yeah, me too. Actually, I don't know the pick. You don't know the pick. Okay, no. so he he's the star actor of the Lovecraft country yeah. show. Yeah, which I haven't um, checked out yet. Good show again. So plug for the show. Check it out. He's the star actor. Uh, he does a good job. He's a compelling actor. You believe he brings intensity to the roles. So awesome. it's, it's nice. Good. Um, That's going to be needed. Yes, yes, yes. And you can see that he he just has a mind for playing these different characters, which is going to be very required based on the fact that Kang, there's many variations of him. There's not just one Kang. <laughs> we'll get into that, but that is, that is an understatement. <laughs> and they are each... Sent like sentient of themselves, like they are, they're He's individual personalities. He's but quite they're... comparable to Cable. Yeah, because yeah. Cable so, also has a lot of versions as well. Yes. Now we will talk about many little points along the way. There will be what? the Neb- Nebula Kang. There will be um. Amari. Well, a lot of that stuff I might skip, but uh, we're gonna skip that. Well, maybe. Well, uh, what did they call Mantis again? Oh, uh, Mantis is uh, she is the uh, celestial Madonna. Okay, so we'll probably talk about that. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk, and we will talk about Nebula, and we will talk about uh, the the celestial Madonna and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there's basically about four main Kangs that you need to know about, though. That's uh, uh, yes, four. Technically okay. five, but four. Four so, to five. Yes. Why don't right. you list them off? Who are who are the main ones that we need to know about? Because right. there's other ones, but they aren't as relevant. Um, Marvel does a good job at nipping up the uh, confusion at some point. They try and clear up some of the fuddles. But they do like to use Easter eggs. So knowing these names, these alternate these alternate identities, um, these names might get used in some way in some kind of reference in some kind of movie or TV show. And knowing these names, we could spot it and see, <gasps> it's coming. That's right. So, okay. All right, let's Kang's, Kang's first appearance was as Ramatat in Fantastic Four issue number 19 in 1963. So that's back in Egypt. He basically takes control of Egypt. That's, yeah. that's the one. Um, that, yeah. Ramatat. That's- that's right. So Ramatat's the first one. He that's what he was first known as. Uh, he was introduced as Kang for his first time as Kang in Avengers issue number eight in 1964. So a year later. Yeah. 
So that's two. Uh, between then, uh, he was shown as the Scarlet Centurion. And he's also known as Immortus. Yes. Immortus would be arguably be his second most well known moniker uh, next to Kang. Uh, Kang Prime. Well, yeah, yeah. And there's also Iron Lad, and there's also uh, Victor Timely as well, which we will touch base on both of those. But essentially, the main ones Immortus, Kang Prime, mm-hmm. Kang the Conqueror, and Ramatat. That's right. Essentially, those are the mainstays. Iron Lad becomes more relevant later in the story. That's right. And yeah, so the guy, actor's name is Jonathan Ma- uh, Majors. Is the guy who's going to be playing Kang. And, mm-hmm. Ant-Man and, and Ant-Man and Wasp, Quantum Mania. Sounds like WrestleMania. Quant- yeah. Quantum Mania. That's right. Yeah, I'm expecting some vicious clotheslines into the next timeline. <laughs> yeah, drop kick there- you into the past. I'm sure there'll be some stunners in there. <laughs> okay, so um, his first appearance. So, okay, so before Kang was Kang, Kang was actually Nathaniel Richards, and he was actually born in the 31st century. So, in yes. the 31st century, he is a scholar and a historian. Very smart dude. He. Um, was even bullied viciously as a child for um, pursuing such passions yes. in, in the sciences and in, in the maths and the languages. Yes. And I keep in mind, he was created back in 1963. And on back in 1963, that's, that's the life that nerds had. Nerds got bullied Nerd. all the time. That's the, way, that's the way things was in 1963. Losers. And they figured that, you know, 2,000 years later, if things will still be the same, bullies will still be picking on nerds. Yeah, now, it was, when I said vicious, there was one story where where a boy even slit his throat at one point. Oh, wow. Yes, like, in, in, bull, in bully harassment and just belittlement, like, his throat was slit because he pursued such passions and, and these so, geeky... So that explains arts. his, uh, that explains his, uh, his aggression later on then yes so i wanted to just give some uh some some hindsight i guess to the creation of what is to come yeah it's good um so uh there is this was never confirmed but the theory is that nathaniel richards is actually the son is actually nathaniel richards jr technically he would actually be the son of reed richards uh, time traveling father who was also n- named Nathaniel Richards. So he'd be NJ. You ever heard of an NJ? Because they're both called Nathaniel. So maybe he's so not the son of Reed Richards that he would be the grand. He was. It's he might be the grandson of Reed Richards' dad. Also, I not- think he was named after Reed Richards. Now he had at one point told Doctor Doom that he was his. Um, ancestor, I believe, but yeah. that, I think that was incorrect. Yeah, that's or he right. Would, he had just lied to him or something. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, but what happens is uh, Nathaniel he finds um, in one of his research of the of the past he finds one of Victor Von Doom's time traveling technology and one of his time traveling devices. He uses the, this device to go back into ancient Egypt to create this persona. Rama Tut, so he could rule uh, over Egypt. Uh, the ship that he built to travel back in time, <laughs> doom! <laughs> um, when he the device he the, he he crafted to travel back in time, uh, he he built himself a ship that was in the form of a um, of a sphinx. Thanks. Yes. So, which is which is funny because. Marvel used this as their reasoning to how the Sphinx, how the pyramids, how things got into Egypt. Not the pyramids per se, but the Sphinx. How did the Sphinx appear in Egypt? This is how. Yeah. He did it. Yeah. And um, I, I'm pretty sure, because this, this was back in 1963. Back in 1963, there was no apocalypse. But in a retcon, I'm sure, 
they explained that the reason, another reason why Nathaniel Richards went to the past in ancient Egypt is so that he could find in Sabiner and so that he could uh, claim in, in Sabiner for himself to be his heir. Well, it was during his uh, initial uh, trip to Egypt, though, when the Sphinx was there, it was when the Fantastic Four came. Yes. Right? Now, the reason they came back to the past of Egypt, Yes, okay. When Kang crash-landed as Ramatut in his Sphinx, he was blinded in the crash. Okay. He figured out a way to fix his blindness. He was able to regain his sight. Reed Richards sees, years later in the future, hieroglyphics of uh, a pharaoh restoring vision. So Ben... Ben, the thing, Ben, ben uh, I forget his last name. Ben Grimm? Uh, yes. Ben Grimm. So his girlfriend, Alicia, is a blind girl. They went back to Egypt to meet Ramatut to give her sight back. That was their whole reason for being there. Interesting. I didn't know that. Right. So they they get there. They're captured by him. Whatever plan he has is thwarted. And... Uh, he goes to escape in yes. like some little capsule pod of sorts, right? Yes. Okay, so when he escapes, In Sabanur was there in Egypt the whole time. Yes. He just didn't stay in the timeline long the timeline long enough to meet him and yeah, for everything got... to happen. That's right. He wanted to, but he never did get to meet In Sabanur. But I think it was the Fantastic Four's visit to Egypt that, that showed In Sabanur that there were powered people out there. Oh, that's interesting. That's right? Interesting. So that's what set him on his four horsemen of the apocalypse mission. He saw the Fantastic Four. Yeah, that's interesting. Now he needs his four. Well, there's also Cable. It, cable... That's not for sure, but you can just see the correlations. Yeah, because there's also Cable, because remember Cable traveled back in but... time to try and kill N. Sabiner before he becomes Apocalypse. Um, which his presence there is what infects Apocalypse with the virus that allows him to uh, fuse with the celestial technology to become Apocalypse to begin with. We'll do an episode Apocalypse on Apocalypse. is another time traveler. <laughs> we'll, 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 do, we'll do with him. We'll do with, we've dealt with Cable. <laughs> I, uh, did we do an Apocalypse episode? I can't no, recall. We wanted to, but I pro- postponed it because I, I'm such a, a fan. One. I'm such a fan of Apocalypse that I want to read his stories before I talk about Apocalypse. So we, we postponed Apocalypse until I know the stories better. We did do Cable, though. We Kenny did do Cable. Correct. Yes. Okay, okay. So all this back on track. Yes. Um, so after he escapes the Fantastic Four, he travels back to the 20th century, and this is where he meets Doctor Doom. Yes. And uh, this is where Doctor Doom, where he tells Doctor Doom, he thinks that th- that uh, Doctor Doom is his ancestor, uh, which it's, it's not, but he believes so. Um, and then uh, Richards, he designs himself his own armor based off of Doom's armor, uh, and started calling himself the Scarlet Centurion. Now, a as good. a th- What's that? This is where, yeah, this, it's basically just the red armor. That's right. That's right. Uh, so this this person is going to last very long, but uh, essentially it's a one and done kind of thing. So he showed up as a Scarlet, uh, uh, the Scarlet Centurion. He ends up pitting the Avengers against uh, alternate reality counterparts of themselves. And then, Pretty awesome. And then once the Avengers, you know, of course the Avengers, they went out against their evil counterparts because it's comics and it's the Avengers. And this Was is it like, the Avengers versus the Avengers, though, or was it the Justice Supreme? It might have been the Justice Supreme. So it was the Justice Supreme, which is not the Avengers. Essentially, it is Marvel's rendition of the Justice League. Okay. That's, yeah. where, that's, that's where Hyperion is from. Yeah, so... That's who they fought against. It was not um, double Avenger versus Avenger. It was the the Justice Supreme or the Justice. There, there's another name. Um, it was it was them though. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the group that they, uh, they, they, he ends up pitting against them, and that yeah. was the introduction to Hyperion, which we have mentioned a little bit in past episodes, but we haven't done an episode on Hyperion because he's just not present in anything outside of the comics right now. We are not quite there with him, but he. I don't know a lot about the character, but from what you've told me, he sounds pretty damn cool. He's Superman. He's got Superman's origin. He's from an alien planet that got destroyed. He got put on the ship to be sent to Earth to save him. He got raised by, he got found by good whole American family yeah, who live off a farm. I mean, it's, it's Superman's origin. Superman. <laughs> but anyways, All right, I see it. I see it. Uh, the Avengers win and they end up forcing uh, Nathaniel Richards back to his own timeline. Uh, so when so after this, Nathaniel he tries to return back to the 31st century, but he fucks up. He over, overshoots it by a thousand years. He lands in the 41st century. Um, and the, but being or the that 43rd it, century, I think. Being that this is not like a continuation of his 31st century, this is another variant timeline that he's now created. Because every time he goes. And time travels, he's he's just like the Loki show, creating new branches of the timeline. It's not right. his flow. That's so right. when he does his jump back and goes forward, it's another branch off. And in this 41st, 41st 40, 43rd century, yeah, it, it's barbaric. Yes. They yes. do not have the technological advancements that he had of a thousand years prior. Yes. Well, sort of. So in this in this world, um, uh, but uh, so um, just pause for a second. Uh, you want to know a, the best way to explain time traveling with the, the diverging paths and whatnot? It is ironic, but you know who explains it the best and probably simplifies it the most? Who's Dragon that? Ball. Dragon Ball Z with Trunks. Trunks goes back in time to try and find Goku or trying to save Goku from dying because in his timeline Goku dies before he could try and stop androids 17 and 18. Well, in, right. when Trunks goes back in time to save Goku, it's not android 17 and 18 that get resurrected, it's android 19 and 20 that ends up waking up and Trunks is like this is all wrong. And then when android 17 and 18 show, up, they're actually more powerful than they are in his timeline and even though they defeated Cell in this timeline. When Trunks goes back to his timeline, it didn't change anything. Um, everybody still dies. So it's the exact but, same, exact same idea. Even though, so Trunks, when he goes back in time to try and save his timeline, he's saving their timeline. His timeline remains untouched because he's not really traveling to a different timeline. He's traveling to a different reality. He's uh, traveling to a different. A different Earth, where in this Earth, Goku lived, whereas his Earth, Goku died. That makes sense. So, so the idea around time travel is more that you've just gone to another point in someone else's reality. Mm -hmm. Not that you've actually been able to change your own future of That's right. everything that you know in your current world. That's right. Okay. That kind of clears it up a little bit. Yeah. Like I said, Dragon Ball. They actually made they actually made this entire thing like like the whole entire explanation with the different paths that it did in Avengers Endgame and blah blah blah. Look how simple that was to explain. Dragon Ball, done. <laughs> but anyways, done. Well done, Dragon Ball. <laughs> in this future, it's war torn. Um, pretty much, humanity destroyed ourselves. We've developed technology far beyond. So the, the whatever uh, surviving humans that are on earth are still using technology that are like way way advanced beyond a technology that destroyed their own planet but they don't even know what it is that they're using anymore all the smart people are dead <laughs> that's pretty bad yeah so when nathaniel shows up here well he's the smartest person on earth with yeah. access to all this technology, this advanced technology, even advanced for him. But he is smart enough to figure this shit out. So he gets a hold of all this advanced technology and just conquers Earth quite easily. Oh, yeah, because he is able to essentially rise to power as the king, saying, look, I can solve your problems. I can fix stuff. I can make this work. You don't know how to do it. Um, 
<laughs> and then he, he this is where he builds the suit, right? Yes. So, um, uh, so after after conquering Earth, he uh, builds a domain. He builds a ship. He builds his armor, and he uh, he builds a dominion throughout the galaxy. He 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 rules the galaxy. That's how yeah. powerful Kang becomes. Which is why, like you asked, why is he the villain of Ant Man and Wasp when Kang is like should be the next Thanos? He is a Thanos level threat. He should be. Should be. Yes. Now, now, basically, when we're saying it's like a war torn future state, like they show a picture of, I think, the continent at one point. It's all cut up into like regions, almost like it was in that story, Old Man Logan, where the Hulk rules here and, you know, Kingpin owns this land. And it's all like region. And then it's like the the Kang's region, and then uh, what the the lady he loves, their region, and it's like four or five little regions, and it looks like Europe smashed together. That's all that's left of the world. Yeah. So, what does Kang do with this nearly destroyed, dying planet? He decides, "Fuck this noise! I want more! I want more power! I want..." I want subjects. I want people to bend to my will. He wants to rule. Yeah, absolutely. So what does he do? He decides to set his eyes onto the 20th century. Yes, because he knows if he stays here in this timeline, like it, it, it ends in failure. Like they are literally working their way into nothingness. Um, I think, once he takes control, he creates peace, does he not? That's essentially what he wants to do, sort of. He's not quite doomed. That's, that, that's doom. Like, you know, uh, but, but this is where he's, he decides to start spreading out to conquer because the world yes. that he had now been in, he had resolved the war, he had ruled everything, and now it's just boring. Well, no, he's they... not there yet. He's not there yet. Oh, he's not there yet. No, okay. no, no. We'll get to that. Okay. So his first appearance as Kang, this is now, now all of this that we've talked about was between 1963 and 1964. Not really. There's a lot of like stories played out later on. And this is all retcon information compacted into a neat, orderly fashion. But all of this happened between 1963 and 1964. <laughs> because yeah. now we're on his first appearance in uh, Avengers in 1964. In his first appearance in Avengers... Um, uh, Kang with his new battle armor, with his technology from the forty third uh, century, um, he captures the Avengers, all the members of the Avengers except for Wasp and Rick Jones. Uh, so Rick Jones, if you guys aren't familiar, we've had mentioned him in past episodes. He is Hulk's best friend. He's the kid that Bruce Banner pushed out of the way. The, to save him from the gamma bomb that turned him into the Hulk, that's yeah. Rick Jones. Man, yeah, Rick Jones didn't push him out of the way. Imagine yeah. it could have been Bruce and Little Little Hulk. They yeah. could have both been Hulks. Yeah, <laughs> Bruce is a dick. He wanted all the glory. Well, I mean, Rick Jones uh, becomes a member of the Avengers, a, a, a honorary member of the Avengers, because he eventually becomes Captain Marvel. He got he gets a hold of the Nega Bands and becomes Captain Marvel. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He becomes a host of uh, of uh, Genus Genusville. Uh, we're gonna have to do an episode on on uh, on. Uh, we've done an episode on Carol Danvers. Now we got to do one on Marvel and Genusville. Ah, okay, okay. We'll but yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't mention this. The only thing that uh, Nathaniel Richards Kang has going for him is his time travel abilities. He has no powers. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to go over that. His intellect. That's right. I was going to go over that. I was going to talk about his powers and abilities. And powers is he has not. <laughs> well, this is a good time to intro his powers because we're yeah. talking about his suit. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's a good point. All right. So, let's scroll down. Suit is where the powers come from. Yes. Okay. Well, well, put the brakes on that. So first of all, as we mentioned, he's a scientist. He's an extraordinary genius. 
there's a reason why he thinks that he is a descendant of Reed Richards and uh, or and or Doctor Doom. They're the only people smart enough to sp- to spawn <laughs> somebody as intelligent as Nathaniel Richards as Kang the Conqueror. That's how smart this guy is. He's an expert historical scholar. Uh, he's a master physicist specializing in time travel. Uh, he's an engineer, and he's also a technician. So he builds his own robots. He designs and builds his own robots. Um, Very impressive. Armed with 40th century technology, he has his highly advanced battle armor, which increases his strength to the point where he could go toe-to-toe with, like, he could trade punches with the Hulk. That's how strong he is. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when we're saying, like, like enhancing his strength, I mean, like, He's stronger than Iron Man in that suit. Like he could go toe to toe with the Hulk. He goes toe to toe with Thor on a consistent Pretty basis. Impressive. Yeah, yeah, I saw that in the comics. He's just blasting Thor. Thor's blasting him back. Yeah. Um, and the animated series uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Um, one time Hulk is just blasting, bla- just punching, punching, punching into Kang's force field, and Kang's like, "Piss off, pissant." <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but that leads to so uh, he is capable of energy projection, hologram projection, and force field projection. Like I said, his force field is powerful enough to withstand a Hulk onslaught. Yeah, it's like uh, well enough. He's got enough air and food uh, supplied in his armor to sustain him for 30 days. Yeah, a month basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it also allows him the uh, it gives him the ability to control other forms of technology. Oh yeah, you can tap in kind of like the Transformers, right? Where they just started like controlling other yeah. things with, with the cube. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With his time ship, uh, he has access to the technology from any century he wants. So keep that in mind as well. That's another reason why Kang is really powerful. He has access to technology from any time. That's insane. Um, he's also uh, made claim that his ship has enough firepower to destroy the moon. Just by hitting him with the ship. Well, no, like it's weaponry. Okay. Like it's it's got a it's got a beam strong enough that could destroy the moon. Which you know, after talking about Dragon Ball, it's really not impressive because you know, Vegeta. Been, yeah, there's been a lot of things that are like able the moon. to kill planets. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's the power level of his ship. I mean, it was he probably didn't a build claim himself to fame way back in the years where uh, they're like, "Yeah, that's powerful." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, he is naturally more resistant to radiation than any other humans of our present time. Yeah. Now he can still basically overload off radiation, hitting like a critical mass point. Yes, he's not immune, but he is more resistant. Uh, which that's going to come into a story we're going to talk about. Um, as Ramatut, he also used an uh, an ultra diode gun that saps the will of humans, um, and if set at a higher frequency, it's also able to weaken superhumans uh, and also prevents them from using their powers. That's how he was able to uh, compete with like Fantastic Four and subdue the uh, the Avengers and whatnot. And um, firing the gun on the same person for a second time reverses that effect. And that's it. That's the list of his powers. Um, (laughs) But, okay, so... You've heard, so you know how in the Marvel and the MCU, Thor explains that everything that they do seems like magic to us. It is all science based, it's all technology based, so advanced that it's magic to us. That's the Asgardian stuff. Well, that's essentially what Kang does. He could do things that we would think is magical with the how advanced his technology is. He could make, th- he could. Use telekinesis. He could control machinery. He has this force field. He has this super strength. He has flight, teleportation, time travel. 
Um, I mean, it's the, the things he could do is ridiculous. It's like like how Doom uses his like future tech and magic. Yeah, it's like it's like the same thing. Yeah. Scroll back up here. Okay, so in his first appearance, he captures all the members of the Avengers, except for Wasp and Rick Jones. How they get out of this mess is Rick Jones and his friends, they pretend that they want to help Kang, um, but they end up double-crossing Kang as soon as they gain access to his ship and manage to free the Avengers. This is 1964, folks. <laughs> That's Fooled them! The... <laughs> Fooled them, got them! Smartest guy from the 31st and 41st century gets fooled by a couple of by a couple of kids. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> um, the rascally little bastards. Kang, so when the Avengers get released and they start fighting Kang, Kang releases, this is where Kang releases this radiation. So he, he just happened to have this radiation on his, on his armor, on his suit. And he just expels this radiation because he himself is immune to this radiation because from, where he, from his timeline, he just, this is just in the atmosphere. Yeah. Thor, he ends up using Mjolnir to absorb all of those, all of that radiation, and then he sends it all back to Kang, a concentrated beam of all this radiation. And Kang, know how intelligent he is, he knows he can't withstand that much of focused radiation. So that even that would kill him. So he fucks off, he escapes. Yeah, that that's the comic I had saw where he basically hits his like critical mass. I'm I'm gonna overload and I'm doomed. And he, he runs <laughs> doomed. <over>. And he <laughs> fucks off in his spaceship. Um, the next uh, the next story he tries to defeat the Avengers by using a robot Spider Man, but Spider Man ends up destroying that robot Spider Man before that robot Spider Man could even get to the Avengers. End yeah. of that story. <laughs> <laughs> It was uh, just but, like, look, Kang and Spider-Man, and next. That's right. Um, the next story, though, is um, uh, it, this one here is more important, more relevant. Uh, this is where uh, they explain how Kang falls in love with Princess Ravona. Now, Princess oh, yeah. Ravona is a princess of one of the different vast kingdoms that Kang conquered in the 41st century. You know how I said that he conquered... The galaxy, well, she is a princess of one of these planets that got conquered by Kang. And Kang fell in love with her. Yeah. But she didn't return his feelings. She didn't she didn't love Kang at all. So very similar to Thanos. So Thanos, he's in love with Lady Death. And she doesn't reci- uh, uh, reciprocate this love. So to show his strengths, he decides he's going to kill everybody. To show Mrs. Death. That's that's his motivation in the comics. I'm gonna send you all the souls. That's right. That's his motivation in the comics. Kang like, no. Kang to flex his muscles. He goes back in time, captures the Avengers, brings them to his timeline, and after a few attempts of them trying to escape, Kang subdues the entire uh, the uh, all the Avengers. Yeah, he beats them. Yeah. Um. But what happens is that even though he did all this, this still didn't impress Ravona. Kind of reminds me of that uh, uh, Shania Twain song. That, that don't impress me much. Yeah. <laughs> Ramon. Every time you say Ravona, I get reminded of Ramona from Scott Pilgrim. Me too. <laughs> I, I hear Ravona and I see the blue hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we covered Ravonna, that too way back in season one. Scott Pilgrim, check out our Scott Pilgrim episode. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I can't believe we actually covered that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kenny. It was Kenny you and Kenny, eh? yeah. But uh, so when Ravona and her commanders refused to uh, bow down to Kang, uh, Kang still refused to kill her. He refused to execute her because he loves her. But because of this, his commanders revolted against him. Yeah, what's his commander's name? I didn't write it down. Okay, he he looks like uh, he he basically looks like a Mongolian guy. 
and yes. basically yeah kang just replies with okay we're gonna kill you for your like insubordination yeah so what they do is they end up freeing the avengers and them with the avengers they uh manage to subdue kang yes uh, but in that process uh, ravona is mortally wounded yeah now th- this in the 41st century is when he has his army of where they archonauts or yes okay yeah so okay. yeah it's not just kang he's got his army but still during in the ensuing battle ravona gets hurt and uh, and how she gets hurt is kang is about to get hit by a blast uh um, oh, yeah and because what happened was at the very last second she realized that she does actually love Kang. She fell in love with Kang. So when she sees a blast going to hit Kang, she jumped in the way, taking a blast, sacrificing herself to save Kang. This mortally wounded her and pretty much stopped the fighting right then and there. Kang sent the Avengers back to their own timeline and put Ravonna in cryostasis. Yeah, isn't this where he was given the... Uh... Oh, was it was it later that he's given the option between life and death? That's later. That's the next. Later. Okay, so that's the next story actually. So this is where he pulls a Mister Freeze and puts his wife in stasis and just leaves her there until he figures out something better to do with it. That's right. He is very comparable to Mister Freeze as well. As a matter of fact, a little sideways uh, here. uh, Once again, in Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes, they pretty much pick up from this point because when you meet Kane the Conqueror in Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the the cartoon. When you first meet Kang, Ravona is already in stasis. She's dying, and he is trying to find a timeline where he could find a cure for whatever it is that's killing her. Oh, okay. So, more like Mr. Freeze. Yes. But Ravona is still a major uh, player, whether she's alive or not, in Kang's story. So... That means that when we do get Kang in Ant-Man and Wasp, and if we do get Kang in next episode of Loki, Ravona might be mentioned somewhere. Well, there's been a few Easter eggs already in the Loki episodes. Um, You had to be really watching to see them. One of the people they already showed a glimpse of in one of the early episodes was uh, Agent Peggy Carter being taken by as loki's like being dragged somewhere you see her getting dragged back down a back alley okay just different characters we might have already seen that we might not have even realized yeah no kidding so we got to keep our eyes peeled for loki we might need to go rewatch a few episodes oh, absolutely yeah we might have already seen glimpses and we don't know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah so the next story is, um, as we already sort of kind of alluded to, um, Kang meets the Grand Master. Now, we've met the Grand Master in the movies, I'm pretty sure. Have we? Uh, what was, uh, uh, what was uh, Jeff Goldblum? Jeff Goldblum in Thor Ragnarok. Pretty sure he was the... Uh, Pretty sure he oh. was uh, the Grand Master. On the uh, planet that the Hulk and Thor are fighting on. Yeah. Pretty sure he's the Grand Master. I think he go, is the Grand Master. Let me go check that. He offers him basically... Um, a, he, he challenges him to like a tournament of sorts. The winner of the tournament will gain the power over life and death. So yes, Grand Ma- Jeff Goldblum does play the Grand Master. Okay. So basically, yeah, in this tournament, oh, uh, winner yes. of the tournament gets power, control over life of life and death. That's right. And so the wager he does with the Grand Master is that the Avengers are going to be the playing pieces. They're going to be the pawns. And so the Avengers, they were about to win the first round, but the first round went to a draw because the Black Knight showed up and he didn't know what the fuck was going on. He ruined everything and made first round to go into a draw. Yes. So round two was now the winner 
gains power of life or death, not both. Well, it wasn't revealed then, so they did the round. The Avengers win the second round. Then after that, that's when the Grandmaster says, you only won one round. There was a draw in the first round, and the Avengers won in the second round, so you get now you get you don't get life and death. You uh, you get life or death, which is pretty generous. You could have just said, no, you, you didn't win. You didn't, you didn't win. You don't get nothing. It's all or nothing. But no, he gave him the choice, life or death. And it's only temporary, too. This power that the Grand Master is going to grant. Um, you got to use it quick. And oh, basically... and by the way, may I uh, uh, point out to, to you that, once again, this is the character that Jeff Goldblum played in Thor Ragnarok. Bet you none of you th- even realized that he was a being powerful enough to grant people the power over life and death. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. They did not allude to that at all based on what they <laughs> what they allowed to happen on his planet. He's actually the brother of um uh Del Toro and uh, uh he's the he's the collector's brother. Oh, okay. So Guardians of the Galaxy, Benicio Del Toro, the collector, mm-hmm. and the Grandmaster. Their brother is, is the who's more powerful, the Grandmaster? No, they're, they're pretty much on par. Oh. Yeah, they're pretty much on par. So the collector. I thought the collector. I thought the collector got wiped out in one of the movies. No, he did. I mean, uh, uh, Thanos, Thanos uh, bitched him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but that got retconned essentially. Yeah. So the collector should be back in the MCU. Yes. Cool. Okay. Anyways, okay. Anyways, all that so, tangent aside. Yes. All that tangent aside, um, Kang has now been given the choice: life or death. He either bring the love of his life back to life or kill the Avengers. What do you think he chose, audience? I'm not going to wait. He He's chose to kill to. the Avengers. <laughs> yeah, he's like, fuck my girl. Yeah. Death beyond them. Yeah. See, that's, that's the hatred he has for the Avengers. He chose to kill the Avengers over saving the life of the love of his life. Which, you know, this guy here does a lot of time traveling. Why does he need some kind of special means to bring her back to life? Can't he just go pluck her out of a timeline where she's not dying? It would have to be a timeline where she also fell in love with them, also That's didn't true. jump in front of a blast. And That's true. It, that, that gets hard again. He ends up winding himself back up in Egypt just to get ahead of the game. <laughs> you know, like that was the whole point of him starting this whole vicious cycle. I need to be, you know, in charge of apocalypse because I know one day apocalypse rules the world. So I need to get there to get enough influence over him. So he sees me as like an idol. So then like he's my servant ruling the world later. That was, that was the whole point of his initial back travel. Yes. <laughs> Oh so, man, Kang! <laughs> yeah, like he's he's spent his whole life doing all this random bullshit and off tangent stuff, and I don't even think he ever gets in control of Apocalypse. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> so um, he chooses the death of the Avengers, but he gets stopped uh, just in the nick of time because the Black Knight, not an official member of the Avengers, was still present. And he ends up stopping Kang and saving the Avengers. Hmm. Okay. And we will see the Black Knight coming up in the Eternal movies. Oh, we will. Awesome. I think so, right? Won't we? I don't know. I haven't heard anything about it, but he might be. I thought he's part of the Eternals, is he not? No, no, he's not in Eternal. Oh. Oh, well, he may be. I don't know. Don't, I don't, know. don't they have uh, Jon Snow playing the Black Knight? Possibly. We'll look into that again. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He could be. He could be an Eternal. I don't know much about the Black Knight. I was pretty sure that they got Jon Snow from Game of Thrones playing the Black Knight in the upcoming Eternals movie. I think you're right, and I that I, that might not necessarily make him because remember, Black Knight started off as a villain, so he could be a villain in the uh, in the uh, in uh, the uh, Eternals movie. This is true. Do you know what's funny? Hmm. Because the other brother, Rob Stark from Game of Thrones, he's also going to be in the Eternals movie. Oh, yeah? 
So both of them are back in the movie. Their final scene that we see on screen in Game of Thrones, Rob Stark's about to head off to war. He hands a sword to John and says, next time I see you, you'll be in all black. Because he's going <laughs> off He's going off to join the Night's Watch. <laughs> the, but he's re-entering the Eternals as the Black Knight. <laughs> next time I see you, you'll be in all black. Yeah. <laughs> Game of Thrones predicted the future. That's funny. I, that I'm calling it now. <laughs> I'm calling it. All right. So the next important story to explain Kang is oh, one tie up on the last one. Yeah. After Black Knight saved the Avengers, the Grandmaster brought back the love of his life. He restored her. Oh, and he did. He yes, he brought her back. So he he healed her. She was able to recover, and he told her the decision that Kang made. He said, I gave him the power to save you or kill them. He decided to kill them. And she goes, well, fuck you, Kang. I'm done with you. <laughs> that really, that's funny. Yeah. Which also explains the next story a little bit more though. There. Uh, so I just wanted to add that little tidbit to the end to tie that up, to give a little bit more meaning to, you know, like redemption of decisions. Yeah. You, you will Reap suffer you from sow. poor mistakes. You reap what you sow. Yes. Love of his life is back in action. She wants nothing to do with him. Yeah. So, the, so okay. So, the, that, that does transition into the next ep- next story very well. So, Kang, the next time he shows up, he shows up in the Avengers ma- mansion seeking the Celestial Madonna. The Celestial, the Celestial Madonna, Madonna, turns, Madonna. Out, turns out to be Mantis. You remember Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy? But now the Celestial Madonna, the meaning of this is this is supposed to be the one person on Earth that if they have uh, a child, if they reproduce, it will be the strongest person in the universe, essentially. That's right. That's right. So Kang wants to marry Mantis so that he can be the father of the most powerful being in the universe. Yeah. He's just hacking the system. He's like, you're going to give me the next athlete. Now... Here's where things get fun. All right. So, in the meantime, there's a future version of Kang that got tired of Conquest. He got <laughs> bored of Conquest. Yep. So, what he does is that he returns back to ancient Egypt and he returns to his Ramatut identity. But this time, he ends up ruling Egypt uh, as a bene- benevolent ruler for the next 10 years. So this version of Kang, he's actually a good guy. He's he's done the conquering. Conquering is born. He actually wants to try a different approach now. He wants to be more benevolent. After he rules for 10 years, he then decides he's going to take the long way back and puts himself in suspended animation so that he can get woken up in the 20th century so that he could talk to his evil version and talk him out of becoming Kang the Conqueror. <laughs> oh. Wow. <laughs> um. <laughs> that is the long game. Holy shit. Yes. Uh, but so- like, even if he convinces this guy not to become him, he's still done it all. Yes. What's the point? Just to try and prevent him from experiencing all the things that he has experienced. It's irrelevant. Like, like let him experience it. Like, yeah. it'll happen again and again. And again. Okay. Yeah. So Kang is defeated by the team up of the Avengers with Ramatut, which is Kang, but as Ramatut. Yes. Uh, but um, Ramatut. Uh, even though he's there to help the Avengers, he was unable to prevent the accidental death of one of the Avengers members, the Swordsman. Okay, whoever that is. He's just a dude who uses a sword. Fuck I, I think his sword is, like, special. It can cut through anything. It's, like, <laughs> magical or something. Maybe it's Excalibur. I don't know. The uh, Swordsman. Yeah. Um... So yeah, and then yeah, Kang is defeated by the Avengers, but he escapes, uh, or he is, uh, he gets away. Um, 
so but uh, in a separate adventure so in an adventure uh to so this is where another tie into loki now okay so the next right. adventure it happens in limbo oh and, yeah and in limbo this is where immortus is um it's revealed that Immortus is a future incarnation of Kang and Ramatut. Mm-hmm. And uh, while attempting to travel, uh, so <laughs> don't ask me why, I don't have an answer. But while attempting to travel to the Crusades, Hawkeye accidentally gets, uh, comes across Kang, sending both of them to the Old West. Oh, right. This is where... Two Gun Kid. Yeah, yeah. And this is where that other persona that I had mentioned earlier, uh, Victor Timely. This is where the Victor Timely comes in. This is where Victor Timely comes in? Yes. And he Uh, he forms his organization? Yeah, he becomes mayor and, and, yeah. He Uh, founds um, Wisconsin, a town in Wisconsin? Yeah. Uh, Timely, Wisconsin. Yeah. Um... I imagine this is um, Owen Wilson. No, no, Owen Wilson, uh, like his his character is an actual character, uh, <laughs> and um, but the the time the time the timekeepers are actually involved in Kang's story as well. So that's yes, another yes, tie yes. to Loki. The timekeepers yes. are related to uh, are in uh, Kang's story. And Limbo, Limbo was where we were at last episode, where all the Lokis were at. That was Limbo. So this is where we are in right now. When they hit you with the stick, then they dissolve you. They send you to Limbo. That's right. And there's two Limbos in the Marvel Universe. We have to clarify that. So Majik rules the Limbo on the edge of hell. Yes. This Limbo is a separate place altogether. It's, It's purgatory Limbo. Yes, two exactly. Di- two different places. Two it's, different places. This limbo exists outside of time. Yes. Um, yeah. And the way that you said uh, Kang is involved with the Keepers of Time, yes and no, it's more so Immortus. Yes. Yeah. So, but Q Immortus, Immortus, Q Immortus. Is in, this, in this story, Immortus is the... In, so you know how in the last story... Ramatut team with the Avengers to take on Kang. Yeah, it's always Kang and another Kang, essentially. Yeah, because in this one, it's Immortus who teams up with the Avengers to take on Kang. And Immortus' overall goal, although we don't maybe know it now, it's revealed a little later, his goal is to whittle off all the other Kangs. Immortus wants to be the last Kang. He wants to be the only Kang. He is the final form, Frieza's end evolution. It's, It's... where he needs to end up, it's 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 the uh, his pinnacle point essentially. Yes. However, so in this story, Immortus teams up with the Avengers to fight Kang. It was in this story where uh, Kang trying to muster the strength to defeat Thor to overpower Thor. Kang accidentally overloads his own armor, destroying himself, killing himself erasing the existence of Immortus and Ramatut, because both Ramatut and Immortus are future versions of Kang the Conqueror. So when Kang dies, Immortus and Ramatut stop existing. And this is all in limbo. Yes. Yes. Uh, so they so, kill Kang and no, by... no, this wasn't this wasn't not in limbo. No, this was in the old West. Oh, okay. So in the old west, they kill Kang. Yes. Or they and by killing Kang, Immortus and, and Ramatut cease to exist. That's right. Wow. That's right. Okay, so they got rid of all the Kangs. They're all gone. Mm-hmm. Until the Secret Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so- because at this point, Kang essentially they think he's dead. They think he's gone, and he essentially is until Doom gets the power of. The Beyonder. The, the Beyonder. I was going to say the Beholder, yes. but it's the Beyonder. Yes. And Actually, he decided the, to bring was, him back. Well, I, well, it was the Beyonder who decided to bring him back. because So Secret Wars is the Beyonder. He takes 
all these villains and all these heroes on Earth, he would decide to pit them against each other in this big, grand uh, Hunger Games, essentially. That's what it is. It's Hunger Games. Um, and when the Beyonder does this, he actually plucks Kang from an alternate timeline uh, where before he dies and brings him to this battle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. And he shows up with, uh, with his armor, his uh, future armor stuff. That's right. Um, and it's in this where it's revealed that Kang did indeed die. He really did die. Uh, but, so here's a little thing from the, we see in the Flash stories, because Eobard Song is very well known for doing this. Kang has gone through time, through different timelines so much that there are so many different versions of Kang throughout all of time that um, you can't really kill Kang. You kill Kang, well, that's just this version of Kang. There's, there's like a, a incal uh, incalculable amount of other Kangs out in the timeline. Um, it's it, you just can't kill him. Like that's right. <laughs> that's right. There's so many. Did we talk about the council? Not yet. This is that's actually coming. So, okay. uh, Kang discovers. Uh, so Kang, he so during the Secret Wars, this is where Kang first goes into limbo, and it was in limbo where he uh, finds out that this is the uh, the Lord of Time, Immortus. So Immortus has already been known. People know who Immortus is, but Kang doesn't know that Immortus is a future version of himself. So Kang stumbles upon limbo. He starts stumbles upon the fortress of the Lord of Time, but he thinks that the Lord of Time is dead, so Kang moves in pretty much. Uh, he essentially just moves in and uses the viewing screens that Immortus used to use to see through time, and Kang sees through all these timelines and sees other versions of himself across all these different timelines. That's how Kang knows about all the different Kangs. He thought it was just him, and, and when he left... Like, he, he took himself with them. But essentially, every time he left, he left one behind. That's right. It, it's like he duplicated. That's right. And little does he know is that these, it's not just by coincidence that these view screens are showing him other versions of himself. These were used by Immortus because, like what you said, Immortus's ultimate goal is to be the only Kang. So how did he do that? By being able to watch the other Kangs. To be able to see what all the other Kangs are doing. Yeah, because... um. Immortus lives in limbo. That's right. And he works for the Time Keepers. He yes. is he's one of their wardens essentially that, you know, like goes and tracks down people. Yes. He would be like one of the people tracking down Loki right now. Yes. Um Yes. And when he finds his other Kangs, yeah, he gets rid of them. Yeah. Well, so uh, before he starts doing that though, uh, the first thing he does is that he goes back in time to the point where Ravona, just before that point where Ravona uh, dies and brings her into limbo, saves her and brings her into limbo so that she never dies. Yes. Uh, but this unintentionally creates an alternate reality where he himself dies. Because remember, he saved her. She jumped in the path of the laser, saving him. So yeah, he goes he back in time and he snags her before she gets hit by the beam the beam kills uh, Kang killing him um, so this is where Kang he gets the same idea as Immortus now Kang he gets in his head that he wants to be the only Kang all these other Kangs aren't worthy I am the one true Kang I am the Kang Prime so he, so he embarks on a plan to start taking out all these different Kangs all these different divergents Except for two. There are two Thai versions that were just too cunning. Kang Yu, that there's no way that he was able to take them out uh, without them teaming up with him. So that's where they team up. And they form the, 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 con uh, the Council of Kangs, essentially. They uh, form the... Um, I have it written down here somewhere. I think it is the Council, isn't it? The, the, the Cross-Time Kang Corpse. <laughs> or also known as the Council of Cross Time Kings. 
Um, it was also in this time that Immortus reveals that his uh, he faked his own death, so Immortus wasn't dead, and he's actually manipulating all of these events from behind the scenes. Um, the stories unfold, and the other two Kangs do eventually end up getting destroyed, leaving yeah. only the Kang Prime and Immortus. Yep. Um, um, and so Kang, how, uh, how they defeat this Prime Kang is Immortus tricks them into absorbing the memories of all the other versions of Kangs. Oh, yeah. And this drove Kang Prime insane. Uh, I think they, they have to then, like, split the memories back up between the remaining Kangs. Yes. And then they're able to kind of, like, stabilize their mental states. Yeah. Um... So once, he def- once that happens, once Kang goes insane, Immortus sends the Avengers back in their own timeline. Yeah, because they're like, all right, cool. He's been dealt with. I'll do my own thing. You guys get out of here. Exactly. So this, this insane Kang, this Kang Prime, now diverges in two alternate versions of Kang once again. Uh, one of these ends up joining... So one of these ends up joining the cross the cross-time Kang Corpse, uh, which is oh, sorry, I kind of got ahead of ourselves. So the cross king, the cross time king corpse happens after all of this, and this is from the divergent king prime who joins this king corpse, um, which consists of a wide range of kings from multiple timelines. So uh-huh. when we thought that the king prime was the last remaining king, no, there's like I said, there's there's an infinite amount of Kangs throughout the timeline. Uh, alternate, alternate reality, different Earths. Different Kangs from different Earths. It's probably safe to say that for every Kang we know, there's probably ten we don't. That's right. Because you got to remember, every time he diverges and goes to another timeline, he essentially left one behind to continue on, kind of. And he then put himself in another one. But then when he bounces out again, how do we know that someone in one of these other timelines didn't bounce out again at some other point? So it's like, bing, bing, exactly. bing, 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 Exactly. So there's just like endless Kangs. That's right. So this council, this council of cross-time Kangs, their purpose is uh, to search out the celestial ultimate weapon. Um Um, and this Kang, this Kang that joins the Cross Time Kangs, he ends up renaming himself as Fred. <laughs> and it's it, the reason why he calls himself Fred is because it's it was kind of like a tongue in cheek, because Fred Flintstone. How ironic it is to have to use a prehistoric name for a being that's that travels through time. So he calls himself Fred. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Fred has a brief encounter with the Avengers while trying to stop Nebula from interfering with the timeline. So this is where Nebula Nebula comes in. Nebula is the female Kang? No, Nebula is um, is um, uh, fucking Gamora's sister. Oh, that Nebula. That's Nebula. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, So... King Prime recovers. Oh, so the King Prime that went insane, he ends up recovering. He he recollects his brain. He's no longer insane. He regains his sanity. Yep. And then the first thing he does when he regains his sanity, he tries to manipulate the Avengers into a time vortex. <laughs> um, the fact that they, they encounter the Fantastic Four in a bid to capture Mantis. Uh, trying to use her to defeat a celestial and the and other kings. Um, in this story, Fred is incinerated by uh, a, a nebula possessed human torch. Not sure how nebula got the ability to possess a human torch, but nebula possesses human torch and uh, uses human torch to incinerate Fred. Bye, and then, yeah, 
And in the ensuing battle, Fantastic Four wins because it's Fantastic Four, obviously. They always win <laughs> after it. Yeah. Um, I think I have got one. Yeah, I have one more story. Because beyond this, like, it's pretty much a lot of, like, think about time travel and the stories you could do with time travel. And the, the cliches of time travel, Kang's done at all. Uh, there's really nothing much you can think of. But, so, this one here is really important because it's near and dear to my heart. And this is a story that we've actually talked about in past episodes as well. We've mentioned this in our episode, both on Wanda and on Vision. More on Vision than Wanda. At some point, Kang travels back in the past to prevent uh, the, the bullies from attacking Kang. So way back at the beginning of this episode, we mentioned how Kang got bullied, right? Yeah. So Kang travels back in time to stop these bullies from bullying him, hoping that'll make him not evil. How'd that work? Not well. <laughs> uh, young Kang meets old Kang and is horrified by how evil and how mean his future self is, and uh, he doesn't want to be that Kang. He doesn't want to become Kang. So Nathaniel Richards, the young Nathaniel Richards, he ends up stealing one of Kang's armors and retreats back to the past. Um, and using one of these armors he stole from Kang, he enacts an emergency protocol that was created by Vision that starts recruiting members a team that eventually becomes the young avengers so he recruits uh, cassie lang who becomes stature he recruits uh tommy and um uh, uh tommy and billy who yep. are speed and and uh wiccan, wiccan. uh he recruits um forgot her name but the art but the one who becomes a new hawkeye I forgot her name. Uh, Bishop. Remember. Something Bishop, I think. Katie, um, Katie I Bishop? Remember. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can't remember. Anyways. Hawkeye's yeah. daughter. No, not related to Hawkeye, actually. Oh. Yeah, not Hawkeye's daughter. Oh. Uh, they might make her Hawkeye's daughter in the MCU. Uh, once again, more stories leading towards we're going to get a Young Avengers sometime in the MCU. Oh, it's building. It's yeah. definitely building. Yeah. So, anyways, so um, and so this Nathaniel uh, Richards, he um, he renames himself as Iron Lad. So he pretty much recruits the Young Avengers. Yeah, I know. I'm. Um, I'm. I can't wait for them to give us the Young Avengers too. I'm such a fan. Uh, but yeah, so he renames himself as Iron Lad to be the. So they have a young Hawkeye, they have a, a, a young Scarlet Witch, a young uh, uh, Quicksilver, they have, oh, Hulkling, uh, they also uh, get Hulkling, so a young Hulk. That, that, uh, that's a scroll, isn't it? Yes, yeah, he's a scroll. They don't know it at first. They, they don't know his origin. It's revealed later on that he's a scroll. Okay. But, um, so yeah, so they become the young Avengers. He becomes Iron Lad. Until Kang shows up in their timeline, and Kang, uh, he shows up in their timeline to pick up this brat, the, this young version of himself that needs to go back to his timeline, or his shit won't go the way it's supposed to go. Um, so a battle ensues, and Kang is killed fighting the Young Avengers. Oh wow! Yeah. Um. So, but what happens was. Uh, with the death of Kang, if Kang dies here, then so much timelines and histories it gets destroyed, gets disrupted, and new times gets created, and who knows what it does to everything. So what does Nathaniel Richards do is that he decides to go back to his own timeline so he could put everything back to him. He goes back to his own timeline and erases his own memories of what happened with the Young Avengers. So he has no recollection of forming the Young Avengers. He doesn't have he doesn't have the recollection of the friendships that he built with these Young Avengers. Being Iron None Lad. Of it. None of it. He erased all that all that information because he needed to restore time. But the armor remained and the armor gained sentience and his armor became the new vision. 
So, if you remember in our episode of Vision, Vision dies at a point. And he remains dead until this story where the Sandy Richards goes back in time, goes back to his time, so goes back forward in time. <laughs> and, somewhere. And, he winds up somewhere and Vision comes with. Well, no, and then Vision comes back to life, essentially. Uh, wow. uh, not really, but it's a, like a, a young Avengers version of Vision. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it's he's kind of like a... One. He's kind of a, an amalgam of Iron Lad and Vision. Yeah, that's why I figured it wouldn't be just like the same guy. No, no, no. And this time, rather than having the the personality implants, uh, imprints of, of Wonder Man, he has the personal imprints of Iron Lad. Right on. So I think one of them. I think um, the the Archer chick. She falls in love with Iron Lad. So when so she was really d- distraught when. Uh, when uh, Nathaniel went back to his, when he went back to his timeline, but then when this vision gained consciousness, I think they started they started a relationship. I think, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I read those comics. The vision and the Kang, or the vision and the and and the um, v- well, the, uh, the this young Avengers vision and the Archer chick and the oh, the okay, Hawkeye, okay. the Hawk, the Hawk girl. Yeah. <laughs> All right, where does this bring us then in the timeline? Well, that's pretty much that's like I said. From here, this uh, the Young Avengers happened uh, just before Civil War, so everything that we talk about here goes all the Civil War. Now, from Civil War, like I said, it's we we're gonna go event from event to event to event. But the important thing to mention here is it's event after event after event after event. So about a decade, there is no Kang. There is no Kang story right. until like 2010. Now, with them bringing him into the MCU, they're going to get to pick and choose which of these Kang storylines that they pursue. Because oh, yeah. there's, so, there's so many Kangs, like they can just pick up and start anywhere. Like I said, the one thing that I can almost guarantee we're going to have is that we're going to have the love of his life. We're going to have a Ravona. Either she's going to be conscious or she's going to be in a glass case. Either way, she's going to be involved somewhere. Easier to just put her put her under ice. You don't have to pay the actress as much as the <laughs> line. Yeah, give her uh, give her to Vin Diesel's uh, uh, payday. Uh, yeah. I am Groot. <laughs> I am Groot. Exactly, exactly. Just dumb he it down. He doesn't even have to act. It's just yeah. voice acting. He doesn't even have to act. It's just voice acting, and he's got one line. That's I didn't even know that was Vin Diesel. <laughs> I, I didn't even matter. Could have been a raccoon for all I fucking care. <laughs> Between p- him playing Groot and him playing the Iron Giant, <laughs> Vin Diesel has had some pretty easy gigs. <laughs> yes. Well, all 10 Fast and Furious gigs, all he has to do is keep claiming something about family and keep, you know, just get in the car, drive down the block. Here you go. Essentially. <laughs> Ten movies later. I saw this meme on Facebook and 100% totally agree. So right now, the latest uh, need for um, uh, um, Fast and Furious is Fast and Furious 9, right? Or F9. So. It's called yeah. F9, right? The next one better be called uh, Fast 10 Your Seat Belts. Or I'm gonna be (laughs) 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 Oh man. And then what can eleven be? Eleven. F eleven? Fuck it. Yeah. (laughs) Literally just fuck it. F I T. Like (laughs) eleven. Oh man, they're getting out of hand. But all right. Anyways, back to Kang. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much everything I had for Kang. So we talked about Immortus. We might do a separate episode on Immortus because Immortus himself has quite a bit of story to talk about as well. He is another villain. Uh, even though they're the same character, uh, they, he is another villain for the Avengers. As a matter of fact, we did mention Immortus in our episode on Carol Danvers because remember, it's Immortus' son that impregnates Carol Danvers yeah. to give birth to himself. <laughs> Which gets retconned and they kill him off. That's right. 
Yeah. But that still happens. So that's that was, that was the rape of Carol Danvers. That's right. That's and we right. talked about that in the Carol Danvers episode. So check that out. That's right. But that just leads to – it just goes to show you this is just Ken. We haven't really touched on the Immortus. We mentioned him here and there, but we are going to have to do a separate episode on the Immortus. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, if that covers everything that we have today. Yeah. Stay tuned for the final episodes of Loki. We might get some more uh, reveals. I'm excited. Yeah. I wasn't really sold on the first two episodes. I'm like, hey, I'm still not. I'm, okay, so I'm enjoying it. The last two episodes were way better than the first two episodes. Um, uh, I, I, I really like female Loki. Uh, female Loki, she keeps on calling her powers enchanting. So is she supposed to be the enchantress? Because there is an enchantress. Uh, no, it's just it's just she's using that part of the Loki powers that he has in his repertoire, but they haven't given the mainstay Loki. So it was in the final episode that they finally they took off the blinders for for Loki. And uh, who's the, who's the old Loki in in like like the eighties? Loki concert? I've always wanted. He's the one who's using illusions. He's the one who is using mass sorcery. He's the one who, like, he raised an the entire actor. city. Oh, the, the actor. actor. Is, the was, actor. Was there, like, a Loki in the past? Like, did, he looks like... No, the reason why he looks familiar to you is because he was... Uh, he was in something... Oh, uh, what was he in recently? He was in something else just recently. Uh, one second. Let me go Google that. I figured he was like they must have done a live action Thor or something in the past, and he must have played Loki, and they must have just got him to come and re redo his role. <laughs> that that's how he looked to me. Like he was just some guy that they got to re reprise a role. One second, I'm gonna blow your mind a little bit here because my mind was the, a little blown. The kid Loki is the most powerful Loki, isn't it? Um, uh, I would say probably the old man Loki. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, he's, he's the one who was actually using illusions and whatnot. He seems the one who actually has a mastery over yeah. magic. But it was the one that finally beat Thor. That was the child. Oh, right. Yeah, he killed that Thor. Pretty, that is pretty impressive. Yeah. Okay. Oh, classic Yogi. Okay. Richard Grant is his name, and Richard Grant was. In Star Wars, he was General Pride in Rise of Skywalker. Oh, he was. He was a, yeah. That's it then, huh? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. That's what it is. He was in Logan. He was uh he was Dr. Rice in Logan. Is that the guy who couldn't go in the sun? No, no, that was uh that was Caliban. No, he was the scientist. Okay. Yeah, remember, so you have the, the, the mercenary, and then you have the scientist. The scientist is the one who built the Mecha Wolverine. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's who he played. That's, that's who he played. He was the scientist who built the Mecha, Mecha Wolverine. Okay. I, no, that's fine, then. I thought he had more of an uh, important Easter egg than that. No, no, no. No, uh, that is it. All right, so stay tuned, like I said, for final episodes of Loki. You might get a reveal into what's coming next. Yep. Maybe My, we'll get a glimpse of Immortus or something. A friend of mine had mentioned that uh, the ending of Loki might tie into the upcoming What If series. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that could be as well. Because once again, people ask me what I think the Loki series is going to be. And I had mentioned possibilities are endless. This is a guy here who is known for his illusions, for his transformations, that he can make himself appear whatever he wants to appear. He can make other things appear whatever he wants to make appear. He could almost rewrite reality. I mean, in some respects, he can rewrite reality. He's, his power over magic is that vast, which we have not seen him use at all. In my opinion, Loki in Loki has been kind of a bitch. Well, till the final episode. Yeah, right? yeah. 
now yeah. they're basically gonna finish this the season with him being re- stepping into his power the way that Thor stepped into his in Ragnarok. Yeah. Right? Like we didn't get to see Thor Thor. No. From the until, beginning. Until that final fight until in Ragnarok. Ragnarok. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that now, was a, that was a pretty badass moment, I have to admit. I think they're doing the same thing for Loki. I hope so. Because Loki has not shown to be anywhere near as powerful as he should be. Hell, he doesn't even seem as powerful as he was in Avengers. The first Avengers movie. He was more powerful. He was doing, like, more enchanty stuff. <laughs> yeah. He was fucking... Remember when he was up against that entire crowd? The kneel before Loki? <laughs> mm-hmm. But I feel like he was just delusional and in the first ones it was like hi you're this god that came from some other world and now you think everyone's below you right so when he entered earth he thought he was a god he's like bow below bow beneath me like i am all powerful i am an asgardian the asgardians rule the nine realms no he later learns you're a frost giant you ain't shit yeah so i think it's like a humbling journey that we've seen with loki where he came out the gates with a lot of a lot of boasting power but that was it he's boasting and he's like i think i'm all powerful no you get your hand like, like you get your ass handed to you by the avengers then you get told you're adopted your own parents didn't want you you're the runt of the ice giants like he goes through like a humbling phase and you know what what was it that thor had to learn to be able to be worthy for mjolnir he had to yeah. learn humility. Humility. They're doing the same thing. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, a, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with yeah. that. Like, Hell, it just all leads to a story where Loki finally holds Mjolnir. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Like, that's why I'm okay with him being a little bitch for now. Like, we know he has the potential. It's just when they choose to give it to him. Yeah. Yeah. So... So yeah, so who do you want to do next week? Um, I know we've talked about the Suicide Squad. We we're going to do them. Oh, right. Yes. Yes. All right. Yeah, let's do the Suicide Squad. Cool. Yeah, that's let's coming out soon. Yeah. Um, Black Widow came out on Friday. I haven't watched it yet. Might watch it tomorrow. I, I got family in town, but uh, um, spoilers. All, all People are already putting up spoiler videos onto YouTube. So For Black Widow. I watch need... this before you see the movie. And I clicked it. I read the comment. You don't need to watch this before seeing the movie. No, no, like, no. Oh. I, I, no, I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch anything. But the, the part that pisses me off the most is people will put spoilers in the fucking thumbnail of their video. And, and that'll spoil things just by me just passing my eyes. I just, I'm scrolling through. I see a video I have no intention of watching because I am avoiding spoilers and the thumbnail is a spoiler. That pisses me off. Avoid the internet. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now, Gotta watch it quick. I'm going to have to watch it tomorrow no matter what. Even if my parents are in town, uh, I'm going to have to get them to, we're going to have to download it and watch it as a family. Um, uh, I mean, we're going to rent it and pay for it as responsible adults. Thirty four ninety nine dollars off Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Plus hey, man, tax. I want to go see it in theaters. But right now, the theaters still aren't open. If the theaters were open, I'd be going to see it in theaters. Heck yeah. But, but I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait for theaters to be open to go see Black Widow because... No. Spoilers. So, fuck it. I have to watch yeah. it in our living room. But uh, need That's to watch okay. it tomorrow. I'll watch it tomorrow. That's okay. I think I think I'll do the same. Find a day this week, and we'll drill it out. Yeah. And in the meantime, we'll prep for the upcoming Suicide Squad two. Yeah. By doing number one. Yeah. With John so, Cena. The peacemaker. Peacekeeper. <laughs> uh, peacekeeper. I think. We'll find out. Yeah. We'll find so out. We know all these characters aren't in any of the comics. We'll find yeah. out. Well, next week, Suicide Squad. <laughs> yeah, for instance, we did Poison Ivy last week. She actually was part of the Suicide Squad at different parts. She worked with Amanda Waller. So, boom, that was our lead-in. 
We'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place, 8 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash creative nerds. Thanks for joining us.